comic book junkies, it's the Frog Queen here, and today I'm bringing you another comic book review. This time I'm reviewing issue one of the third story arc in Peter Milligan's ancient Roman detective series, Britannia. This one is called The Lost Eagles of Rome. The series follows the adventures of Rome's first and only detectioner, Antonius Axia, who receives his position after being imbued with the power to understand the souls of people and their intentions. If you've watched any of my interviews with the author Peter Milligan, then you already know all this, as we talked a great deal about the series and the role of Antonius. But just to give you an idea of when this takes place, it's during the time of Emperor Nero, somewhere between the year 37 and 68 AD. In this story arc, Antonius is once again sent to do the bidding of the tyrannical Nero. He's to go into the apparently dreaded Germanic forest of Tottenwald to retrieve the stolen golden eagles of Rome, and he's not at all pleased about it. Not surprisingly, Nero elects the adventurous Achillea to accompany Antonius on the mission, and we met Achillea in the last story arc. She was a gladiator. She's a lot friendlier in this issue because Nero has made an oath to free her if she and Antonius return victorious with the missing eagles, but no one under Nero's reign is actually free, so... Sorry, Achillea. I'm actually really happy that there is a reoccurring female character in Britannia besides the less than virtuous Rubria. Rubria is self-centered and manipulative, which are qualities most modern people would equate with the word bitch, but if you think about Rubria's position more deeply, she's still somewhat a slave. She was forced into becoming a vestial virgin, like all the others, and although she has some power in being the head of the order, she's still constantly being threatened by Emperor Nero and fighting to maintain what limited power she does have. And because of her status, she has to go about her goals in more secretive and conniving ways. Plus, let's face it, bitch is just a word that people use to refer to women who have ambition and opinions. Anyway, I like Rubria, but I think for the most part, most people, um, she really just serves as a sort of secondary villain. It's important to note that Milligan doesn't waste the issue with simple setup and long-winded reminders of what happened in the last two story arcs. In other words, you're not simply sitting down to read an introduction to the arc. Things actually happen. It's not one of these really boring introductory first issues, like so many that you see these days. And it's not short, um, which is actually really nice because I find a lot of first issues lately have been kinda lean on the page count. However, without spoiling the plot, I am going to talk about a few things in this issue in particular. Axia is kind of hilarious in this issue, although I enjoyed him spilling his guts to the reader about his love for Achillea, or I guess lust is more appropriate since he complains that he is no longer satisfied by prostitutes, which makes me think that he only really sees her in a sexual light. Uh, but I think my favorite part is when Axia uh, just lets this jerkwad veteran just degrade him to his face. And he simply continues on with his detectioning and politely asks him questions. Keeping the grain flowing freely and making sure wretches like you do not starve. Mm -hmm. How was Barry's army destroyed? I mean, Axia did kind of provoke him by making fun of his war wound, his missing hand, but eh, he has his reasons, which he explains, of course. One of the things that might strike you as odd in this story is the friendship between Antonius and his slave Bran. Uh, this is also seen throughout the entirety of the series. Although Bran is a slave, he is a sort of best bud and speaks lightheartedly and actually really jovial in this one towards his master. Often what other people might consider insubordinate, in fact, I would likely have gotten in a lot of trouble if I had poked fun at my employers like this. Uh, you know, modern day slaves we are, but except for now I'm self-employed and really happy to no longer be a slave in an office, but I, anyway, I digress. Getting back to the comic, uh, one of the things I really love about Britannia is that I'm not constantly confused about what's happening. The artwork suits the story, it brings its own sophistication and maturity to the story, but mostly it tells me exactly what's going on, even when the dialogue isn't leading the reader necessarily. 
And I tend to like very linear storytelling. That's not to be confused with a linear storyline, of course, but I do find there are a lot of comics these days that fail to lead the reader and instead expect us to fill in an awful lot of blanks, leaving the mind to wander and thus being completely pulled away from caring about the story altogether. Questions are good, gaps are not. But artwork really should be filling in those gaps. And lately, a lot of stories, I find this wishy-washy artwork, bad backgrounds, there's no setting, just some characters with some kind of blank faces, and that doesn't tell much of a story. Well, I think that does it for this review. Thank you for bearing with me with, through my choppy voice, which uh, is still a little bit scratchy and not so great as I've been ill. But uh, I really love the Britannia series, and I'm looking forward to the rest of this adventure. Britannia is the type of series I can see sticking around for a long time, and hopefully this is only the third in a large number of adventures for Antonius Axia. But before you go, please give this video a like, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and tell me what you think about Britannia in the comments below. I love talking about comics, and I love talking to you about them if you haven't already gathered that. And of course, until next time, read something good.